one panelist for the uh, third session. That's why it's a bit broader topic, as you did suggest, gender, energy, and education, because we will be talking about uh, energy resources, but the main uh, like three panelists will be speaking about gender and uncertainty in the classroom and in the field. Uh, so it will be a little bit broad panel, I think, a discussion. But with, after that, we will have also another, the last, but the, probably the shortest discussion on activism, NGO, and academic work. But after, please stay, because we also have um, some uh, uh, reception, uh, wine, and some snacks, so please stay till the end, don't go, don't disappear. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I hope it's not you're not too tired. It's a no, uh, it's intense. We are having a lot of conversations and discussions and very different topics. We haven't expected to have this uh, you know, range of uh, topics, but uh, I think it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, with this uh, next session will be facilitated by Sibyl, and we have, as I mentioned, four uh, speakers. We will start from Fatima Karimova, whom you already uh, introduced her. She's from Andijan Machine Building Institute from Uzbekistan. And then we will um, have Sona Balasanyan, whom you probably know, the director of Center for Research and Resource Resource and Research Center. Uh, and then Nevat uh, Manasyan, is, she is a quite well-known researcher in the community, feminist researcher, and also she has uh, extensive, she's done a lot of on education as well. Uh, Nevat worked with UNICEF, but now she's more of an independent uh, researcher, and part time you're working in the Transparency International. So, uh, yeah, and then uh, we have Anush Babasan from uh, the Executive Director of Women's Resource Center. And uh, Anush will be speaking more about education on sexuality, sexual and reproductive health. Mm -hmm. So that will be more important. Please continue and then after that, until we, no, until that you are here and thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. Um, so I'm an anthropologist and I'm, I have been working a lot on gender issues in different fields. That's also how I came to be part of this uh, project, this collaboration with uh, Goha and Sinan. And I uh, will start a new research project in next February on electricity production in the Swiss Alps, uh, where I will also look at the dimension of gender. And uh, so my idea for the first panel was to talk about gender, energy, and resources. And actually, when I prepared my uh, input, my short input to this um, session, I realized also that if the question of education is, uh, is very important here. So for me, it makes very much sense to uh, combine actually these two um, sessions. So I will have a short, my short introduction input, and then I will um, uh, leave the floor to the panelists. I will um, I, I take the Lara as a role model, and I will also uh, tell you when my minutes are um, done, so then you will have another one, two minutes uh, to, to wrap up. So, and so like that, I think we should manage to be done in an hour or so. Good, so I uh, start with my presentation on gender and energy and climate, because I, I realized when I uh, prepared it that I also need to talk about climate change uh, when I 
talk about energy. So, yeah, as most of you, or as importantly, know, we take the question of crisis and vulnerability from a local level to a more global level than we necessarily have to talk about the climate uh, crisis, which is uh, largely recognized as uh, one of the, or the most uh, urgent crises on a global uh, scale. Um, it is largely recognized that we are approaching a situation of human-made global warming um, that has a very damaging and irreversible um, effects not only on humans but all planetary uh, life. Um, we're talking about more frequent and more severe droughts. Uh, we're talking about heat waves. We're talking about uh, rain, heavy rainfall, floods. Uh, I think in the last years, at, at least in uh, Switzerland, uh, these um, <coughs> phenomena were also very much present and also uh, in Switzerland, uh, we very much also feel these changes. It's, it's not even any more debated whether this is, these changes are an uh, effect of uh, climate warming or not. I think it's really recognized now even if by the most um, climate skeptical um, persons in, in Switzerland. It's, a reco it's a felt, for example, in the, in the mountains uh, where suddenly there is not enough water anymore to bring the cattle uh, to the, to the uh, grazing fields. So, so it's, really, it's really a topic. Uh, so the international community of states has therefore signed already 2016 the Paris Agreement on uh, Climate Change. And in this um, agreement, they set for themselves the goal that uh, the temperature should not raise more than 1.5% uh, above pre-industrial levels. Um, I think as you, as you know, uh, we are already approaching this 1.5 um, degrees, so, so it's probably will be more, but still the, there is at least there is the commitment of the international community of states to try to stick to this goal and to do as much as possible in order to not to have uh, too much of uh, climate change. And uh, <coughs> one of the efforts that the uh, international community of states uh, agreed to take is of course <coughs> to uh, reduct uh, greenhouse gas emissions and, and in order to do that, uh, it is crucial to um, reduce the emission of carbon dioxide. Um, car carbon dioxide. So it's important to reduce uh, the use of uh, fossil fuels, um, the use of uh, carbon, and um, to replace them by renewable energy sources such as water, wind, and sun. And uh, I made a tour yesterday in Armenia and I heard that also um, geothermal um, plants are actually having a, a play an important role here in terms of energy production so that's, that would also be part of these um, renewable energy sources. Um, so yeah, so that's just kind of to set the context and um, in my short input I want to talk about uh, the role of women or the situation of women um, in this uh, context of climate crazy, crisis and I talk about three issues, the, um, how climate change affects uh, women, how the energy turn affects women and then also um, women's um, position in this energy energy term. So if we take talk about uh, climate change, uh, we uh, one important thing that um, 
climate crisis is not gender neutral as um, any other crisis that we are talking about. And uh, the UN has already actually um, published several reports that show that uh, women are disproportionately yeah. <laughs> um, affected by uh, climate change and that uh, the reason for that is mostly that uh, women um, are also make 70% of the world's uh, population living in, in poverty and climate change is especially affecting uh, people who are already uh, living in hard situations and especially in uh, poverty. So um, one point, for example, is uh, agriculture. So women are um, more, more than men um, employed in agriculture, especially in low and uh, middle, uh, lower middle income countries. And the longer and more frequent uh, droughts, uh, or the, also the heavy uh, rainfalls and floods, mean for them that they have to work harder. Uh, to secure income and resources for their families and it also puts pressure on girls to help uh, their, their mothers uh, in that um, work and then also um, kind of take uh, takes them away from school or means that they um, would have more time um, to dedicate for their um, education um, yeah. The second point is that we go to um, seek refuge in uh, other places. And in the aftermath, women and girls are less able to access relief and assistance, um, uh, which of course threatens them again further their livelihoods, well-beings, um, and this kind of creates uh, this uh, vicious um, cycle of uh, vulnerabilities also for uh, uh, the future disaster. So, so I think here we also see very, very much the connection with the panel, uh, with the session before, right? So it doesn't really matter whether, or at, at least from this perspective, it doesn't really matter. Uh, women are affected by um, disaster caused by crisis or uh, by war or by um, so-called natural uh, disasters. Um, yes, and so this actually relates, or they, there's a second point um, here that is less relevant um, maybe in, in Switzerland. <laughs> and it also is, a, is very much again about um, women who live in, in poverty already. Um, that's the question of access to clean uh, energy and the, also the um, international community of state has set the, one of the sustainable, sustainable uh, development goal, goals as all humans should have access to affordable, reliable, modern energy and modern um, is here also is meant or with modern is made sustainable um, energy. So this, um, so what this means is, or what the context of this is that women are disproportionately affected by energy poverty, and energy poverty has actually two meanings. Uh, so the first meaning is the question of accessibility of clean energy. So do they have, do they actually have? Is is there an infrastructure of clean energy that they can? Uh, access to and um, here um, there are studies um, in countries like India, Tibet, um, Kenya and also other countries um, that show that women um, are mostly responsible for household energy which means that they collect uh, wood and livestock dung uh, for which they often have to, talk, uh, to walk uh, many kilometers and then they burn it uh, for cooking and heating, as I understood also in rural Armenia and the um, wood is an uh, important Also means. the manure. Mm. The manure? Yeah, yeah. 
So, um, so this, of course, um, has effect on their health, um, such as uh, back age, head age, or then especially also respiratory um, symptoms um, due to their exposure to the uh, to the polluting smoke. Um, but if we talk about um, energy poverty, we also need to um, talk about the affordability of energy, and this um, is an issue that is especially also relevant for countries of the global north or developed countries like uh, <coughs> Germany. It's, for example, a, a very big um, issue. So it's uh, energy poverty is also about um, can the people actually uh, pay for the energy that there is, um, that there is there. And the uh, research, uh, for example, in Germany has shown that, uh, that here women, again, are uh, more affected from energy poverty than men, uh, especially uh, single mothers, uh, of course, and also um, elderly women um, living alone who in the uh, in winter times uh, don't have the money to actually pay for the heating in order to uh, to keep warm. So, so we have a situation. Um, that makes actually clear that from a feminist point of view, the energy term is important, um, but it also raises challenges. Um, <clears throat> to shape the world's energy future in a way that not again women are the, mo the ones who um, vary or who carry the costs. Um, yes, so I have uh, done a bit of a research on um, what has been published and I found uh, several examples that, that show that actually as with the energy term, um, if it is not done in a gender sensitive way, it's uh, women who carry the costs of these. And the example that I want to talk here quickly about is uh, uh, sugar cane cultivation in Sierra Leone, Leone by a Swiss um, company. So um, this company has um, hectares, is that 570 square kilometers um, of land. It's, it's huge. Um, in Sierra Leone, uh, where they cultivate sugar cane, and then um, it is produced, this is um, turned into biogas, which is uh, import, exported to Europe. So it's not meant for the people in Sierra Leone, it's exported to Europe. And so what happened there is that this land that they use for the sugarcane cultivation is land that was before commonly used by the people uh, living in this uh, territory. And in order to cultivate uh, sugarcane, the company first had to formalize land ownership. And it issued uh, titles to landowners. And notably, um, these were male household heads of land-owning families. So this meant uh, that women and also uh, non-land-owning families who before had the rights to use these lands uh, were now excluded and um, stripped off from these uh, lands. And in um, addition, the company had promised jobs for everyone in the region, which was also an argument uh, or reason for the um, government um, to sell this project to the local population. Uh, but it turned out to be an exaggera exaggeration. So especially women who before were um, engaged in vegetable planting uh, in this um, territory found that the company did actually not provide uh, jobs for them and, that, and they found that they uh, actually only lost from that project. So, So it needs to be, um, this energy turn needs to be consciously in a way that it is gender sensitive. And I actually see two reasons uh, why 
women again are excluded and um, the first reason is that uh, energy tourism is largely conceived as a technical matter that's also for me as a social scientist so when I um, see in Switzerland for example how funding um, is allocated um, for research on the energy term and most funding goes to the engineering sciences uh, because um, the government wants to push it and uh, they want technologies to make this energy turn um, quick and, um, and the social sciences are not often consulted so if at all we are consulted then it is about the question how can we make society accept the measures and infrastructures uh, for the energy to make the energy turn happen um, and uh, so we are very much in this service providing uh, position um, for the STEM sciences um, yeah, and related to that, of course, research had also found that uh, women are run underrepresented at all le levels of decision making in the energy sector. Uh, this relates to the EU, but uh, I guess it's also um, true for other uh, countries. And um, yeah, so we, of course, have an underrepresentation still of women in the STEM sciences. Um, we uh, still have gender stereotypes that uh, prevent them from um, studying STEM sciences, but as, as we heard today uh, in the morning, uh, pro the, the problem goes deeper. Probably it's not just about bringing women to STEM sciences, or the, it also needs a, a more fundamental um, change in society about the, about the perception of gender. Um, yeah, and so I come to the conclusion so we need uh, more presence and visibility of social science research in energy policy making. I don't know um, um, how we can really achieve that, but this is uh, some, a, a goal that um, I as a researcher in this field think uh, I try, want to try to achieve. Then, as I said, we need to bring women into this STEM sciences, but also, and I think this will be interesting also to discuss, um, the STEM, sci STEM sciences need to become more gender sensitive, so that it is not just um, gender sensitivity perceived as the responsibility of women, right? So it's also uh, something that uh, men should conceive as their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but this is maybe something that, um, that is not so much relevant for this session now. There is an, uh, there are these uh, community energy projects um, that can be really an, a, a good way for, to empower women if they are um, planned and made in a way that they actually try to address women and to bring women from the beginning into this um, into this project so that's actually where my, that's where my research uh, will will go go to yeah but yeah this is my um my short input and um, i would now invite uh, fatima um, to talk about women in the space. <coughs> um, hello, everybody. I'm Karima Fatima. I'm from Anjan Mission Living Institute in Uzbekistan. And I'm very happy uh, to attend today's events and share my thoughts about the gender equality. Um, <coughs> Gender equality uh, is, uh, means that the men and women have equal rights and both have the same means and opportunities. <coughs> also, uh, our <coughs> institute was established in 28 as a, a species institute in the training personal mainly of the automotive industry in the Republic of Uzbekistan. And the institute also located 
since the city of Abidjan and Abidjan is the industrial research and educational, tourist, cultural and transport sector is a Tarkana Valley. Do you know the Tarkana Valley? Tarkanska Valley. It's uh, our faculties. Uh, we have a technical institute, that's why we have a <coughs> uh, faculty of technical faculty of automotive and economics and engineering <coughs> and faculty of mechanical engineers and others. And Angel Machine Institute has strong uh, relationship with the more than 17 foreign universities. And nowadays, <coughs> also we are corporations uh, with the international organization. And do you know uh, Koika? It's from the Korean Volunteer Scale Organization. So we have a <coughs> uh, corporate with the British Council and others. <coughs> and also, uh, our institute established women. Adversary councils that main purpose is uh, protecting the rights of women and girls, improving their spiritual, intellectual, and professional experience level, literacy, and cultural. You can see the pictures. <coughs> Photos from the conference on the gender equality held at our institute. Uh, also, our women are also active in social life and they are always awarded by our state regularly. <coughs> and also, <laughs> uh, first page for foreign partners, photos from the conference, and the gender equality at our institute. Also, civil is first page, you can see. <coughs> and uh, last year, we had a seminar, similar project with the foreign partners, gender equality issues, gender sensitive research, and and teaching, expanding collaboration between Switzerland, Armenia, Georgia, and Uzbekistan, and Austria. Also, our <coughs> women teachers for any project, for example, we have a, <coughs> you know, the international project, Erasmus, or the International Bank, and that's why. Also, these are photos. Visit to young, something, and business women. Our government led too many <coughs> opportunities for the women. Female st and students' activity, you can see uh, at our institute, students are engaged in the activities that interest them. They are also paid a salary. That, well, a salary is not the big uh, money. It's a mission. Uh, also, mm, in Uzbekistan, have a days of the names of the women. Uh, 11th of February is the International Women in the Science and there also we have the 9th of the Day of the Women. And uh, our government uh, nowadays have to the women, <coughs> women a contract pays for the women and girls enrolled in the master degree and be paid from the government. It's very good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the United uh, States of Development Program, uh, cooperation with the Republic of Uzbekistan, is, uh, they are as a committee in Uzbekistan, and they have <coughs> put among the same bodies, gender equality, <coughs> which was granted in Uzbekistan. Laws and programs <coughs> develop state level, and you can see, uh, Women's rule 35 days more than men in India. According to the by the United Nations, <coughs> gender equality is not 35 to 6% more time doing something than boys. This shows that gender equality is still not being the achievement of the world. They before the law of the public of Uzbekistan on the greatest equal rights and opportunities women and men adopted on September and 29th, a comprehensive based legal documents and made a student gender equality in our country. However, it must be uh, admitted that the some countries of wives that the role of women in the kitchen has not completely separate. Therefore, this law envisioned a student's protection for the victim to protect from the protectionist rules today, center for the Revolution and enjoyment victims of the violence we are established in the region and 
uh, and for example, the short numbers 1144 hotline as the one US Committee Republic was established and system of receiving women at least was established 24 hours a day. What does this mean? For example, if your husband and wife uh, fight is the husband who is force of pressure on the wife, it is a proven it will be possible if it's the husband's daughter and he died that contact with the woman for the three days. Do you have these numbers? Your country? <laughs> <coughs> also uh, this year. And we have an article from the condition of the Uzbekistan, housework cannot <coughs> housework cannot be basis for direct and indirect discrimination basis of gender. It's performed a good by women and the religion. Today issues women's employment. For example, you can see this number small workshop but as such is the expensive or not open it anti women and other work for the women. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention and I can see my conclusion of my speech and I would like to uh, continue this cooperation with the um, Foreign Express and gender issues and expanding the participation of the women, especially our family university students and providing practical skills and training. And then I fully believe that the girls will be intelligent, fully understand gender issues and work hard and themselves achieve excellent results. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sona from Cox's Research Resource Center at Media Foundation, that's CRC, and I'm also lecturing at the UFS State University. Um, so um, after the sessions we will have a book presentation mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very happy about that and one of the chapters um, that I contributed to the book is entitled uh, The Teacher, a Woman, Fused Personal and Contested Professional Biographies. Um, and one thing that I will be talking about today as well already from today's standpoint is this contradiction between the personal and professional and how this contradiction always um, puts women into the position that they deprofessionalize more and go into caring um, subculture. Uh, that is also about market segregation, of course. It's amazing how nowadays, even how, even today, so many countries have this uh, feminine, uh, dom feminine uh, caring uh, professions, nursing, teaching among them. And um, this is not only the problem of Armenia, this is a global problem, I would say, and, and one of the major indicators of gender equality to me is whether um, men go into teaching profession or whether they choose nursing as a profession. And so um, here I would like to uh, signify, again, Corny's um, problem that she raised long before this, that is a feminine masochism issue. And um, this uncertainties and crisis we are talking about, I think postmodernists raised the issue long before all this um, conflicts escalated, long before the COVID came. Something happened with the human society. It um, mostly because of the technological issues and this offline, online um, worlds clashing and mixing, we started, I think, being more complex beings and uncertainty became the new norm. And postmodernists were already talking about this um, new normal. Uh, while we were just reading it, I was reading it as a student as a science fiction, I would just read it and say, okay, well, yeah, this is interesting uh, theory um, about diversity, about things that are neither this nor that. Well, we sense it. We have all these symbols around. We have this consumerism, etc. But then 
afterwards, um, as I grow up and I now see all this, I, by living in neither war nor peace condition, um, seeing this um, Ukraine, Russia, war, etc., I clearly see how this became actually the norm. Um, and so in this condition, I see a very uh, high risk <coughs> of women increasing their masochism uh, mm -hmm. towards themselves because this is a result of the dependence of females on a society that pleases men. And so in war condition, this is highlighted. And then uh, when women in a masculine society, when they are socialized in a way that their dependency upon this patriarchal values and um, masculine um, <coughs> beliefs, etc., when, when, when these are perceived as normal, they actually sacrifice their careers, uh, their lives for maintenance of traditional family structures, for raising another generation of soldiers, for um, for, for uh, sustaining this caring infrastructure that has traditionally been uh, imposed as, as, their, uh, as their domain. And so here is where education to me uh, in our society becomes more of an annex or appendix of the family institution rather than <coughs> an educational professionalizing institution itself. Because if we are talking about professionalizing communities, we are talking about professions and careers. But look at how many uh, teachers actually choose their profession themselves. Uh, many of them dream of becoming geographers or uh, IT specialists or something, but then something happens in their life and their either father imposes or mother imposes some some masculine belief or something just raises and they go into teaching profession. And then this woman, uh, well, it's logical, you know, you will start hating whatever was chosen for you and not by yourself. So if you choose your profession without your own uh, independence and you just continue serving this caring infrastructure, you then realize that you're not on your own and you then continue because you already you are already there you continue this and this masochism circle starts you continue raising your children with those beliefs you continue uh you're developing your attitudes towards the pupils with these beliefs and then um, and then <coughs> you would say it is hard to see how any woman may escape becoming masochistic to some extent from the effects of the culture alone. Um, and so I was studying, I had eight t teachers who I talked to for developing this research and then this chapter, I was talking to them for around six months. Now some of them have, uh, have lost their uh, sons or husbands to war and uh, I maintain ties, uh, not too uh, intensively, but still I know them. So it was over six months I was talking to eight teachers from different schools and living with them actually, their profession and their, um, and their personal lives. And they would really open up, taking me to their kitchens, uh, taking, me, taking me to their houses, taking me to their uh, workplaces, um, some of the important places for them, and we, we would have this conversation. And, and I, I have to confess, it was the most difficult research material I dealt with in my whole life. I have dealt with many researchers. I oversee the 15 maybe projects in three months at CRRC, but this is like a research, work research. Mm -hmm. This was, yeah. this became really personal. personal. Yeah. And then I had to analyze it, and thanks to the editors of the book that, that I actually could, could publish it. Because there are so many issues that you come up with when, when you try to understand why professionalism is linked with masculinity mm -hmm. and caring links with motherhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would say being teacher in a 90% feminist community, they would say, um, you know, if men would do teaching, they would do that better than we do. Mm -hmm. Because they do everything better. They are better at everything. Of course. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then you would question that, why do you think so? Why is that? 
because of the caring infrastructure, because when you dig deeper and when you realize that subject matter, teaching the subject matter is something secondary, you first have to raise the map. Mm -hmm. And then you dig what is raising the map. Yeah. And then it's mm -hmm. nourishing that caring infrastructure over and over again. And this is something I think rather massive in our society, and this post work condition may make it even worse because now they will try to again uh, care more, more, and that might might uh, result in rates of uh, sex selective abortion. These uh, So yeah. Yeah, because we need more soldiers, yeah. we need this reproductive. So starting from becoming a teacher where, where a social pressure is mostly the, do the dominant factor why they decide to go into the teaching profession, um, and ending up with um, their understanding of professionalism that is beyond the borders of the feminine school, you clearly see this um, gender stereotypes articulated in classrooms and societies. And then um, the question now is, in this condition of um, bolded uh, nationalisms, uh, bolded violence infrastructures, how then we are to survive without school currently? And I will just maybe um, try to finalize here by agreeing uh, with Aram, who actually validated the results recently with the student, and he shared his insights. Mm -hmm. And he had one more finding that uh, over the also girls are trying to copy this um, destructive liberal ideas mm -hmm. from boys. Um, I would say that would be another chapter for research to look at boy underachievement and why uh, boys are um, perceiving freedom as they do. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it can also possibly be because of the spending of uh, mm -hmm. effects. Because the teachers, they, after entering this cycle, this masochistic cycle, they become, they, their values that they transmit um, in a way that maintains, sustains the structure which they once entered and there is no way back. Thank you for this um, <coughs> depressing you. I don't have a presentation, I thought it was more of um, like a um, conversation and then it's 10 minutes and um, I cannot capture many things. I will, I'm not, I'm an applied researcher, I'm not an academic researcher, so whatever research I have done uh, was linked to a project, even academic research, jointly with academic institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and my interest is um, mostly in education and then equity issues and gender specifically and issues that really impact women. Um, so when I came to education 20 years ago, we were talking about crisis, I'm leaving education, and now I'm working on gender and equity issues. We're still working, talking about crisis, and, and now we're linking it to, to uh, you know, COVID and, and, and other things. And I think this kind of talk about crisis is, is, is an indicator of something bigger that we need to capture. Um, what I'll try to do is, um, I will refer to applied research we have done in different institutions and where I was part of it. Um, but I cannot capture all the, all the things and I'll try to link it to what Sona was talking about. But before going into that, I just want to share a, a, a very short story. My friend's boy, who was an 11 years old kid, uh, was actually um, told by a certified pilot that in, in crisis and emergency situation, this kid can land a, a, an airplane. Um, this kid has not come to any aviation school. He has learned all these skills online, and basically what he lacks is the certificate and the licensing. 
Uh, this is something that we have seen or we have been blinded to for uh, in, in the at least in the education sector uh, as policy makers, as teachers and professors, that uh, people learn in different settings and it doesn't require an institution. We're so attached to uh, our degrees, our institutions, you know, our norms and, and procedures and, and policies that we have missed the point where things have gone beyond what, what we control. And this, is, this has started long, long before. Um, I think what we're bogged into is, and, and we are reminiscing about the times and, and how the classrooms are becoming uncertain. Classrooms are very certain. It's the field that is very uncertain. And when you talk to teachers, they, um, when you try to combine what they're saying, the typology of, of complaint is about um, external factors that they're sensing and they don't see it as something that they, they can control. They see it as something that is a challenge beyond their control, like the IT sector. This is one cliche that I'm now bringing, which is actually from the field. Um, and I will refer to research now, but um, we have to admit that the school is something that was devised and, and, and created during the first industrial revolution and it's for the industrial for the workforce and to make them literate. And this is, we're talking about carbon world. <laughs> this carbon world is dying, it's not, we have to accept that. We're now moving to another um, dynamics in terms of energy production. We're now, as humanity, thinking of how to preserve and make it, it a sustain, sustainable, accessible, and available all the time. This is something that is now being researched. But we basically, we now, before our eyes, we're seeing how we are shifting from carbon and, and fossil fuel, energy-based, very finite societies to something that is going to infinite energy resources. This is really revolutionizing the game. And we do not accept it as educationists. What I have learned in these 20 years, we're very conservative. As teachers, as professors, as policy makers, we are really very conservative. It takes many years, and maybe it's a good thing, I don't know. I'm not trying to very, um, you know, to take this or that side, because I've been standing from that side and the other side, um, and I can, I can provide the perspectives. Um, when for 20 years you see that the, the one of the core stakeholders um, actually disowns the power, and this is one of the recent research, um, uh, qualitative research conducted. It was conducted in combination with experiments in the classroom. Yeah, and, and I, will, I will have to say a little bit more. <laughs> Apparently, this is something internally conditioned. This was done during the war, and this was done during the COVID period. We were uh, experimenting with a number of classrooms in a number of schools, and it was mostly remotely online. What we're trying to do to see what were the classroom practices. Um, and um, it was very interesting to see um, that um, descriptions were very much, um, and I'm referring to teachers, static. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond the research scope and, and, and thinking that anytime we, we think in nouns and adjectives, I think we, we create more risks than opportunities and we uh, perceive our environment as a crisis. Anytime we, we think in verbs, uh, we, uh, we, take, we take charge, we, we feel the power, we are agents of change. And um, you know, like if I say I'm better, uh, already there is something that if it's escalated, I, I can become um, xenophobic or, or very racist. But when I say I'm better at doing something, it doesn't put me above anything or anyone. It's just stating a fact that I'm better at doing a certain thing. And it's an acknowledgement of a skill, nothing more or less. Uh, and we noticed in a classroom that many of the practices our teachers had were very much attached to adjectives and nouns. Uh, and, and we had hard time um, finding verbs, finding uh, processual descriptions, and analysis of the processes. Uh, and that really um, actually forced students to be detached, to start detaching from the process. And what happens, if I'm coming to the gender aspect of it, boys are the first ones to get detached. 
because of what, what is, is called as pseudo-liberalism, um, yeah, it's also embedded in, in how we um, recycle masculinity and femininity in our societies, and it's not only in Armenia. I remember reading tons of articles, both academic and applied, where they were um, observing the classrooms and, and the, the, the verbal composition of the communication, and not only the verbal communication, but the body language, and how it very clearly um, uh, segregated communications uh, between boys and between girls, and how boys had the thing. This is, I'm citing one of the articles, many articles. The boys have the thing, so they are allowed to have more free space, whereas girls are generally controlled and they have to perform to certain standards. Um, and um, my worry is when you look at how teachers do not see themselves also, not only they do not describe students and, and learners as agents of change uh, in terms of using a lot of verbs and describing the processes, they also disown the power as teachers because uh, it, it, it's proved that uh, one of the big factors in the classroom is the teacher in terms of quality of teaching. Uh, but when we analyzed the qualitative interviews in the focus groups, we saw that the factors that were brought up by teachers had nothing to do with them. So in a way, they didn't see their role in um, managing the environment, managing the classroom. They kind of were the passive uh, watch keepers, uh, if I may allow the word. Um, but nothing more. It was more the socioeconomic uh, environment, the socioeconomic status of parents, the educational attainment level of parents, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge list that they were citing that actually impacted the achievement level of the students, but not their deliberate effort in the classroom. Um, after 20 years, and, and you know, many different aspects, I mean, I also work in um, looking at gender norms and how they impact um, how we socialize into masculinity and femininity and we specifically experiment with one of the norms which actually brings uh, leads us to uh, abort the uh, female fetus. Uh, I think when for 20 years you talk about crisis or something you will have to accept that this institution is dying and the only thing we need to do is to preserve it until we come to a full new cycle of new learning modalities. We do have those modalities. I can bring up, for instance, another patch that I can now put a light on it is, is the qualification framework. It's, it was done, it has many reasons why it's done, but one of the things that it allows to recognize uh, my uh, knowledge, competences, and skills and competences even without coming to Freiburg University, I can come and you know, um, you know, be like, uh, give the exam and get the certificate or the degree. Uh, and and oh, when you look at how institutions are responding to the processes, it's not very different from what happened in the medieval period mm -hmm. when they responded to the change. Mm -hmm. And and some couldn't cope with it, so they became some other institutions, and we're now dealing with universities. I think we will have to accept that. A, uh, our learning spaces are transforming, institutions are transforming, some are going to fall off and stop existing, and apparently schools are, would be the most vulnerable ones. And um, I, my only hope is, and, and I'm very optimistic on that side, that it's not going to be a transmogrification, but it's going to be a transformation. And we're going to have uh, more pathways, more uh, more tools to recognize um, the knowledge um, of the person. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, in this sense, the only uh, fear I have in, in, in a very gendered way is how our teachers are sanctioning female students. This is one thing that I'm very worried about, and I'm very happy to learn that a lot of the girl kids are breaking this um, kind of being a good girl thing in the classroom thing and co cat copying boys. Uh, I'm not that afraid of, of, and as a feminist, I'm not afraid of actually um, owning masculinity for a while and, and disowning it because I haven't seen I want to speak 
but also I want to speak a little bit about what we have inside of <laughs> sexual education. And yeah, um, uh, because the time is limited, uh, I will most uh, concentrate on this topic. But if you, if you have uh, general questions on sexual and reproductive health uh, and rights issues, uh, of course you can ask some questions and I can present some challenges despite the sex education. Uh, so first of all, um, I want to say that uh, I want to start with an important point that sexuality in general is a very taboo and close topic <coughs> in Armenia. Uh, and I want to say that people, most specifically women, uh, do not have such kind of safe spaces and you know informational corners where, can, where they can go and get some information on their um, on their rights, on their body choices, on you know some basic information about their sexuality, about their sexual health issues, for instance, about menstruation, about uh, contraception <coughs> methods, about uh, sexual transmitted infections. So. Uh, if we speak about only in Yerevan, yes, in Yerevan there are some kind of NGOs, also trustful some doctors where you can go and so ask some advices or, you know, uh, questions about your sexuality. But if we speak about, in general, in Armenia, the situation in regions, uh, specifically in uh, small cities, in the villages, women cannot have such, women do not have such kind of safe spaces to go and uh, to, to the one NGO or to go to the hospital and uh, just ask for, for, for the advices. Imagine a uh, woman who are, uh, for, for instance, not married in Armenia but sexually active and she go to the, uh, on the region, go to the, uh, you know, hospital to advise some contraception methods. Uh, it's really very difficult issue, challenging issue for her because uh, she didn't know if this information would uh, stay at the hospital, would stay at the room, or would go outside. So we have also a very big issue on confidentiality also. And um, in, this, in this regard, uh, we have uh, ex not accessibility of information in this regard, on specifically on sexuality and specifically on women's rights and uh, women's issues. So also we have a uh, um, very big stigma and uh, shame and discrimination towards those women who are speaking most openly about sexuality, about their needs, about uh, the rights of pleasure, about you know about uh, their, their sexual and reproductive rights. And this is something that um, we raised with, like we raised in, in, in even in, in our families. We are not allowed to go and um, you know speak with our parents to ask some questions to our parents or to, to the school teachers. We are not allowed to even uh, think about sexuality because if this is something that we thought that this is very uh, you know uh, something that we don't uh, want to go to the to the deeper side. And this is really challenging because it affects on our uh, rights protection. Uh, also, when we speak about sex education, uh, we have a lot of uh, stereotypical thinking in the society because um, uh, we had a lot of projects where we, uh, uh, whenever we um, uh, work with parents, also with teachers, and whenever we speak about sex education, people or society think that uh, mentioning sex education is just only about sex and nothing else. And uh, this is really a big challenge in Armenia because we are doing a lot of work to explain that, you know, sex is just one minor part of this whole education system, sexual education system, because they are afraid that whenever we are speaking about the importance of uh, sex education at schools, they are afraid that uh, by, um, you know, by teaching sexual ed education, they would go and uh, practice uh, uh, sexual relationships in uh, very early ages. But in fact, it's not the reality. Um, so in countries where sex education is, uh, appro the, the approach of sex education is uh, on the comprehensive approach, uh, it is much more pr productive and effective way to, to speak with children and teenagers about sexuality and their rights. So in Armenia, we don't have sexual education, but what we have instead of sex education, we have 
healthy lifestyle lessons. Uh, we introduced it since 2009 uh, for 8 to 11 classes, uh, people for 8 to 11 classes. And because our organization are working in, in this field, for us, it was very important to, you know, to do to, to, to do some surveys, to do some research, to understand the effectiveness of uh, these uh, classes. And uh, we started start from 2010, 2011. Started to do some focus group discussions also with parents, with educators. With uh, we did some interviews with. Um, with Ministry of Health, with Ministry of Education, to understand uh, because we we uh, we know that there were very many challenges because we are working with women, with also teenagers, with with young girls, and uh, we could uh, we could like mention that there are a lot of uh, challenges because they didn't have such kind of information and didn't have uh, this kind of lessons and classes. So what we find out um, during that period of time that uh, healthy lifestyle lessons are not like um, um, separate subject at schools, so it's connected with physical education. So uh, pupils are yeah, study physical education, they are doing some physical activities um, during their uh, study and uh, what Ministry of Education thought that during winter period time as uh, <laughs> Um, because uh, in winter they can, you know, people cannot go out and do some physical activities. Uh, they replaced uh, physical education by healthy lifestyle lessons, uh, and they put some information, you know, prevention of bad practices. Uh, for instance, there were topics about uh, using uh, alcohol or like bad consequences of using drugs or using alcohol, things like that. And only eight hours of the whole 14 hours uh, per year uh, was about uh, reproductive health topics. But the thing is, the main challenge was, uh, you know, these healthy lifestyle lessons was, whenever we reviewed the manuals of these healthy lifestyle lessons, we realized that the main approach of these lessons are based on the abstinence method, not on comprehensive method. And the main idea of the abstinence method, like approach is to prevent or uh, doing everything uh, by giving only emphasizing bad practices of sexuality to avoid like teenagers to do uh, sexual relationships in, a, in an early ages. So they put only um, uh, topics like sexual transmitted infections, HIV AIDS, danger of abortion, uh, but not there, they're not include uh, topics like puberty, contraception, healthy uh, sexual relationships, which are very important topic for this age, because when <coughs> we did some focus group discussions with young girls and teenagers, we realized that they are not interested, you know, in these hard topics all the time, uh, you know, speak about STIs, uh, what is HIV, what is AIDS, but they have, uh, you know, very basic, um, like uh, demand to understand what is menstruation, what is puberty, why their body is changing, things like topics like that. Um, and the main uh, challenge, the second main challenge was that um, physical educators who are doing these healthy lifestyle lessons were not very sensitive towards these issues. So they, they, they just uh, answered us that they are not feeling very safe to speak with pupils about menstruation, about even STIs, about HIV AIDS, and they just mentioned that sometimes they are skipping these lessons because they don't have such skills to, you know, to speak with pupils about these sensitive topics. But sometimes what the worst part uh, for us is that they were continuing to do these lessons, but with their own uh, personal approach. For instance, if they thought that, you know, homosexuality is a bad thing, it just they said that, you know, homosexuality is a disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, yeah, this, this was the, uh, the worst part. Um, so, um, also, uh, during whenever we, uh, also I want to mention about some, uh, yeah, I, I want to, so, sorry, I want to bring you one example, case story example, uh, which was in the manual. 
uh, and I want to read uh, for, for you just to imagine how you know discriminative approach they can mention in, in the, in the uh, like in the uh, agenda, in the manual. So Ikran and Zia loved each other since the ninth grade and planned to get married after finishing school. After graduating from school, they got married immediately. After some time, Leah realized that she was going to have a child. She loved children, but at that moment, she would have to give up her dream of continuing her edu education. Moreover, du during the pregnancy, it was found that Leah has certain health problems. She was thinking to terminate her pregnancy, but what about the consequences? They say they may not have any more children after the abortion. Mm -hmm. So as you see, this case is um, like the manual is full of such kind of scary, horrific <laughs> uh, stories. So why should a woman uh, end uh, with her education? Why she can't continue her ed 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 education? Or who said that after abortion she couldn't have any more children? You know, things like that. Uh, but also I want to say about some achievements uh, which are, um, you know, due to our, I don't want to say due to only <laughs> our organization efforts, but we really did and uh, continue to do some advocacy work and raising awareness, uh, also activities among uh, teachers, among, um, you know, uh, um, parents to raise their sensitiveness and, uh, you know, to raise their uh, awareness among why it is important sex education. So more people started to speak the importance of sex education in Armenia right now compared to 10 years ago. So, and I think that that's why the Ministry of Education revised, uh, like reviewed the manual. Uh, uh, of course, we don't have uh, still sex sexual education, but still we have somehow the manual uh, which is included the topics of puberty, contraception, healthy sexual relationship, which is uh, much more achievement for us also. And they started to, you know, from not uh, eighth grade, but they started uh, these classes from five uh, grade, which is also good. Uh, but uh, we are uh, continue our work and we did some like uh, review and uh, send them recommendations. So um, we are in the process uh, also for uh, doing some TOTs with educators right now. So we are not giving up, we are continuing our work. Uh, and in the end, I want to just um, mention you two important links, which uh, one of our organization's uh, website, Women of Armenia, and in the publication section, you can find some researches, surveys, uh, case studies about the uh, SRHR at most, uh, and uh, of course on sexual education also. And the second um, uh, uh, website is serakantsun.org, which, uh, which in English is sexuality.org, uh, which uh, was created by our organization and actually it was our uh, like first in Armenia, first uh, website in Armenian on sexuality. But uh, some, uh, I, I just want to show you, you know, the content uh, as you can see. Uh, it's about sexual organs, it's about hygiene, it's about puberty, you know, the sections. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm, some uh, part of anti-gender uh, movement in 2019 reported to the police due to this, uh, you know, website that we are spreading pornography and we are, we are destroying uh, family values in Armenia. And of course, after the long period of uh, expert examination, they came up with the idea that, oh, okay, it's not pornography <laughs> uh, still. But, you know, this process was full of, you know, hate and attacks, especially on our co-founder, Lara Ahonan, received a, li a lot of messages full of hate speech, uh, full of, you know, attacks. And uh, it's not easy uh, in Armenia to work towards these issues, towards SRHR, towards women's rights. I'm sure that Lid would mention about only the same on LGBT rights. So this is this is the way <laughs> which we are doing, but still we are not giving up, we are continuing our work. So yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions.